very much, Hannah. Aloha, greetings, namaste, tashidale. It's an honor to present at the School of Pacific and Asian Studies Graduate Student Conference virtually today. Before we begin, I'd like to virtually acknowledge that the University of Hawaii at Manoa is on the ancestral lands of Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiian peoples. I'm grateful to be a guest on these lands for my graduate education and this virtual presentation. I also want to acknowledge all of my mentors at UH that contributed to my knowledge and education, especially my mentor, Nina Etkin. I cannot believe it has been 13 years since I defended my dissertation at UH. So it's wonderful to be back virtually. The following presentation uh, is going to focus is focusing on inequality, ingenuity, and resilience on the biophysical margins, navigating short-term household recoveries from the 2015 Nepal earthquakes. I want to start the presentation by providing uh, an acknowledgement to all the wonderful people who've been part of this work, all of my co-authors, collaborators, um, analysts, um, folks that enabled this research to happen. Uh, we often conducted this research in very arduous circumstances and many people enabled it to occur, and I'm only one representing it today. I also want to point out our funders, the National Science Foundation and Portland State's Institute for Sustainable Solutions. To begin, I want to provide a little bit of background on both disasters and disaster recovery in order for us to better understand what happened during the Nepal earthquakes on April 25th, 2015. First, I want to point out that disasters disproportionately impact the most vulnerable. Disasters also amplify pre-existing social and economic inequalities. Disaster recovery is a dynamic, multidimensional, and non-linear process. It has no specific endpoint, and it is a process that takes time and occurs over the short and long term. Recovery has both tangible and intangible dynamics. And recovery is often assessed through adaptive capacity, which is considered a critical component of resilience, a theme of this conference. When looking at adaptive capacity, uh, our definition includes the ability and intention of folks to recover, recognizing agency. It recognizes that recovery varies over time depending on vulnerabilities. And it also recognizes that returning to a pre-disaster state may not be desirable and that we must take into account power dynamics in order to understand root causes. Now I turn to the Nepal earthquakes, April 25th, 2015, around noon. A 7.8 magnitude earthquake hits Himalayan Nepal. Nearly 9,000 people perished and 22,000 people were injured. There were 750,000 damaged and destroyed buildings. Media attention faded quickly after the earthquakes, although there were 400 earthquakes and aftershocks with a magnitude of four or greater within one year after the events, and more than 4,000 landslides were triggered by the earthquakes. Our research looked to respond to these catastrophic events to better understand the dynamics of short and now long-term recovery. To better understand the dynamics of disaster recovery, I provide this model, which I call the disaster resilience cycle. It's based on the disaster risk management cycle, and it has four different stages, mitigation, preparation, an event, relief, and recovery. Our research specifically focuses on the recovery stage after the earthquakes, which in this case meant conducting our research nine months after the events happened. During that nine months, we consider that to be the relief stage when health and safety was the immediate focus and before the National Reconstruction Program initiated. Our research questions for our, our work were, what factors contribute to household adaptive capacity to hazards? And at what point do households transform af in, after disasters? We utilized an integrated social and environmental systems framework. This framework looks at humans and the environment in constant contact with dual feedbacks with one another 
where an impact on the environment reciprocally has an impact on humans. This framework is also conducive to many of the ways the indigenous peoples we work with view themselves in a relational way with the environment. And thus we decided to select a systems lens for our work. We also borrowed from the resilience literature something called the rule of hand, which advises to break down integrated social and environmental systems into three to five domains in order to assess system function Having more domains makes the system too fuzzy and hard to analyze. The domains are composed of multiple variables each. In our study, we then identified critical demographics, recovery indicators, and five domains of adaptive capacity with multiple uh, variables each based on pilot studies and previous research and literature. Our recovery indicators for our research took into account tangible aspects of disaster recovery. We looked at some intangible aspects as well in our qualitative methods I'll talk about later. But our recovery indicators included the rebuilding of home, the recovery of livestock and herding practice, the recovery and sale of livestock products, the recovery of agricultural and horticultural fields, standing crops and seed storage, working and wage labor and tourism, and access to electricity and communications technology. Our domains of adaptive capacity included hazard exposure, which had biophysical vulnerabilities such as landslide proximity and risk and impeded access to farms, pastures, forests, and firewood collection areas. Institutional context included influence of participation in the governance system and other formal and informal institutions. Livelihood diversity includes roles of income heterogeneity and diverse patterns of resource use. And connectivity includes linkages between households and external actors in receiving assistance and the flows of outside ideas. And lastly, social memory encompasses prior experiences with natural hazards and the roles of local knowledge and practice. We then created a model where we conceptualized how we felt our domains of adaptive capacity related to one another to associate with recovery indicators. And in this model, you'll see our five domains, whereas hazard exposure acts on all of the domains, which are included as one unified whole, each one encompassing a different number of variables in them. And those then influence the recovery indicators, which we had 34 total. In total, our study had 209 variables, 174 variables in our model, and 35 demographics. So in order to select our sites, we decided to pick two highly impacted districts by the earthquakes. We selected two VDCs, which were administrative districts at the time. They've been reorganized into municipalities since then. We conducted pilot studies at those sites in order to select the particular communities in which we worked. And one of our criteria were that all primary homes and critical infrastructure were damaged or and destroyed. In order to pick the communities within the different districts, uh, we then had our criteria of accessibility. So near a road or far from a road, having more or less aid, more or less market integrated, and whether or not they had uh, been reorganized into IDP camps and whether or not they had hydropower development, what their diversity was linguistically and ethnically and the governance system at the time. Here are our four communities and how they're geographically situated in Nepal, Kashigao, uh, Aruchinote, Gatlang and Haku. Let me introduce you to them a little more now. Uh, right now on the maps, what you can see in the red is the landslide vulnerability of these areas. Some, you can see how catastrophic that was. All of these areas, are geographically vulnerable to landslides that are from seismic activity that are also triggered by weather events that can be induced by climate change. Our first uh, community is Aruchinote. It's at the end of a road. It's uh, ethnically diverse and in the inundation zone of a planned dam, which you see modeled here. Uh, this map shows how much the critical infrastructure uh, was damaged or destroyed, and all the households shown were either damaged or destroyed. Our second community is a one to three day walk from Aruchinote and has three clusters of settlements, uh, catastrophic impacts from the earthquakes. Uh, we have more ethnic homogeneity here and less aid 
uh, uh, from non-governmental organizations and uh, influenced by missionaries. Uh, Gurung ethnic group dominates here and in Aruchinote it's Nuar and Brahmin and Chetri ethnic groups as well as some migrant Gurung and Dalit folks. Uh, Kashigao is mostly Gurung, Dale and some Dalit folks. In Gatlang, this is our other community in uh, Rasua district. The other is in Gorka district. This is at the end of a road. It's also part of a tourism experience near Longtong National Park. Uh, folks here are primarily Tamang and they uh, practice primarily pastoralism and some uh, farming, whereas in Kashigao, there's a much more balance between farming and herding. Haku is a one to three day walk from Gatlang. This area had catastrophic impact from landslides, which you can see in this uh, map. You can also see that there are some settlements here that were reorganized into displacement camps that were part of our study. The displacement camps you can see geolocated here in our map, um, and folks were divided up among seven different camps um, after going through catastrophic landslides. Some theorize these landslides were made worsened by roads created to build hydropower areas, hydropower dams in the area which destabilized the slopes and then the earthquake happened. That's unproven but theorized. Uh, this is what the displacement camps looked like. They were mostly led by community leaders and um, the government used a slightly decentralized approach in how they were approached. They were also served by various NGOs. Folks were living in these areas for up to two and a half years and had catastrophic impacts to life and property from the earthquakes. Our research utilized extensive training and research in order to integrate uh, both who worked on our project and how much our project was relevant to the recovery efforts in the short term that we were a part of. Because of that, we did everything for making sure that we recruited folks to be part of the project that were engaged in the work, uh, worked previously in NGOs, from the ethnic groups in which we're affected. Uh, we did workshops and trainings for the team on ethics, theory, and methods related to the project. Each place and location we went to at the onset and at each point we did our research, we did community meetings to talk about the research and share preliminary results to solicit feedback. And we did a series of research return workshops to interpret our results before publication at the local level and national and international levels um, to, in order to get the word out. So here's uh, just a pictorial journey through our research in our communities, informing folks about what we're doing, writing one pagers, trying to make what we're doing clear, showing our, this is a training of the trainers in phase two of our research, um, making sure that knowledge was passed on within the project. These are research return workshops after the first phase of our research at nine months. Um, these are banners that we brought all over with us in the research return workshops to bring back memories to folks when we return the final results. These are pictures of us uh, working with the newly elected government officials in 2017 to share our results and to empower them to be a conduit to share the information to their constituents. And we did a series of these workshops with all the elected officials and then we, in addition to folks in the, that were still in the displacement camps after two and a half years, and also returned and brought the local officials to Kathmandu and invited folks from the NGOs, from the missionaries, from the government to hear the stories of folks on the local level in relation to the findings of our project. These results indeed inform the research, and I don't think that we would be uh, where we're at today with what we're going to share without having gone through all of these processes. Uh, lastly, we're part of the National Reconstruction Authority's attempts to take lessons learned from the earthquake and apply them to their ongoing efforts in reconstruction as well as future mitigation. And this includes us being part of a, a symposium on um, Nepal's reconstruction in August 2020 and being part of a special issue in progress and disaster science that just came out last week. So for our research, we conducted a survey, in-depth interviews, focus groups, and research return workshops. We did the survey twice, once at nine months, once at a year and a half, looking at the hypothesis that there's rapid change after a major disturbance like an earthquake and trying to track what that change looked like. 
We then um, return to find the same members of those households or other members of those households at a year and a half to look at that change. We also paralleled that work with qualitative methods to unpack and explore intangible aspects of recovery that aren't apparent in our quantitative methods. We conducted in-depth interviews with 40 individuals at nine months, and we conducted eight focus groups at a year and a half, as well as eight research return workshops at two and a half years. Uh, our primary unit of analysis in this research is the household, and then secondary unit is the settlement. Uh, in total, we worked with 400 households, 397 we found at a year and a half. That uh, equaled 1,992 individuals, and they represent four clusters of settlements, which is what I'll talk about now. So for the work, our average respondent was 40 uh, years old. We had a balanced male-female ratio. Most of the folks in our research were Buddhist, although we had Hindu and uh, budding Christian participation. Uh, we worked mostly with the Tamang ethnic group and Gurung and Dale, but also worked with Brahmin, Chetri, Nuar, Magar, and other ethnic groups, Dalits as well. Um, in our sample, 81.7% of the households were destroyed and 18.3% were damaged. After nine months, 1% of our sample was able to return to their house from a temporary shelter made of corrugated galvanized iron. At a year and a half, 44% were able to return, but this was not equal across our sample, and I'll talk about some reasons why later. For our data analysis for the quantitative, we use non-metric multidimensional scaling ordination, or NMDS. And for our qualitative data analysis, we used inductive content analysis. NMDS is a statistical technique often used in ecology when analyzing multiple variables that are different and complex. So you can have variables that are ordinal, categorical, you can have uh, variables over time, and it's an inductive method that helps search for patterns that then other techniques can be looked at to look for associations and or further analysis uh, based on those patterns. So it's a, a less positivist technique in that it allows you to look for the story and then try and interpret how that story and fill it in with, in this case, in-depth qualitative methodology. This is a scatter plot ordination. Don't be afraid of what I'm showing you. It has a lot of information in it. This is of our 34 recovery indicators. Each one of the 400 households is given one dot in this ordination on the XY plane. And each, each household is given a coordinate in a um, dissimilarity index in that the NMD NMDS analysis looks at patterns of how these households responded to all 34 questions and then organizes them for us into groups in order to point out patterns. Those patterns then help us understand where these households live in what we'll call the recovery space, which is this XY plane. Now these lines coming out are showing the different variables and the strength of their associations. And by looking at where those variables live in the XY plane and the strength of their associations, we can then understand what the graph, what it means where each household is located in this recovery space, mapping the recovery. So each quadrant is labeled here on the results that came out for each one. And you'll notice that the real negative stuff is over here on this side of axis one. Uh, people having impacts to their livestock, not able to go to work, losing livestock life, having impacts to their non-irrigated fields. All that stuff is over here in the negative space on axis one. And up here on the, on the axis two, the variables indicate um, folks that are able to return to their livelihood. So if they might be in a negative position, but they've been able to return to some semblance of a place-based livelihood, mostly agro-pastoral, if they are on this side of the space of access to, which we'll call less displaced. If they're down here, they're more displaced. So then you start seeing some patterns of colors. One immediate one is you see a lot of purple dots here. Those are indicating households in displacement camps. 
So those households, which are all from the same place, Haku, which is four, which you see a centroid here showing the average for, they are in the negative recovery space and they are more displaced. So there are some households that are less displaced but are still in the negative recovery space or in the more positive recovery space and are not displaced. The centroids here are showing the average of each one of our four locations. Our analysis can also show the nonlinear dynamics of each variable. So what I mean by this is that you can have two different kinds of negative outcomes. So you might have your non-irrigated fields, for example, hit differently depending if you have them catastrophically covered by landslides or just marginally hit by landslides or cracked. This graph right here is showing one variable for people who had high impacts to their non-irrigated fields. And you'll notice it almost looks like a topographic map where things, the lines look parallel over here, but then make curves in different ways over here. That's showing a nonlinear relationship for households on this side of the recovery space. And what that's showing is households down here who had their entire fields completely taken out by the landslides who are now less, more displaced in, in displacement camps and people up here who still were impacted by them, but in a different way. You can also view how the different locations recover over time. This graph shows the location of each place at phase one and phase two. And what you'll see here is that the folks, again, that were in the displacement camps got their lives back together on the land, but didn't improve much in their conditions. And you see folks actually over here that went in a negative direction. And I'm going to point out what happened what there later. That's got long. And you have folks over here in Kashigao that started in a more compromised position, but were actually slightly moving in a positive direction. And then you have folks over here in Aruchinote who are always in the best position, but didn't really change much between the two phases. And we can look at this to better understand that where a household starts in the recovery might not be where they're ending up, which shows that things might be getting worse for some, not better. So this is just a little more on how this method can show one location and where they're centralized. Remember what our axes mean, good stuff over here, more on the land over here, less on the land over here. This is showing Aruchinote location one at phase two with the point at zero, zero. So you can see the directions everyone's heading in. Here in Gatlang, it's really apparent where folks are starting in a decent or a better place but are moving in this negative direction in phase two. Next, what you can do is something called vector fitting where you overlay different variables on top of the original ordination to look for correlations. So when we overlay the demographics on top of our original ordination, we start seeing some interesting patterns such as groups in Nepal that were traditionally socioeconomically marginalized had worse recovery outcomes and some folks that were less economically marginalized had better outcomes. There's other things here, but those are some minor things you see in this graph. When we overlaid hazard exposure, you start seeing folks who had catastrophic impacts to their lives, who depended on the land, who were impacted by landslides, who grazed especially, and collected forest products. And folks over here had no impact on that on, from those hazards. When we overhead a livelihood diversity, we see folks in the most marginal places, non-irrigated fields having catastrophic impacts in a more displaced area. And we also see folks um, who are reliant on agro-pastoralism who had their um, livestock um, productivity and um, uh, health affected, but not killed, which means they didn't have the same impact by landslides, but still negative impacts over here than over here. Good stuff over here, mostly in this case, it was irrigated fields. So our results found that the strongest associations with negative associations with recovery included traditionally lower caste ethnic groups and religions in Nepal, um, severe hazard with severe hazard exposure, agro-pastoral livelihoods, and that were displaced and in the worst cases to camps. 
The strongest positive associations with recovery included irrigated farmers, business owners, and folks that were more literate. The strongest associations with less displacement were folks that used the cultural tradition of work exchange, larger household sizes, and homeowners, folks that used some traditional architecture, as well as folks that integrated new ideas. And our content analysis of our qualitative research found that there was high evidence of social and spatial inequality, which I'm going to return to in a minute, that place attachment, uncertainty towards the future, and negative mental well-being interrelated for Indigenous and rural peoples, and that the reconstruction program was slow, confusing, and that the funds were less accessible. I want to show that we balance our quantitative and qualitative findings, even though I know the quantitative seem quite complicated. We translate our quantitative results once we hit our benchmarks into qualitative narratives and then balance them with findings from our qualitative research. This is just an example of one of the supplementary materials from our articles looking at inequality. But I wanna show that there's both tangible and intangible impacts that you need different types of methodologies in order to understand. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about these results in a discussion way through these themes that I introduced in the title of this um, talk, Inequality, Ingenuity, and Resilience. And I want to start with inequality. And something that this study really showed is that rural and indigenous everyday lives are interconnected with structural violence and spatial inequalities, which are then interconnected with hazard exposure, livelihood, and displacement. So poor and marginal folks getting hit the hardest and pre-existing um, vulnerabilities that are produced from history that go back in time help to make this hazard into a disaster. Some of the uh, power dynamics I want to talk about is how the Maluki Ayn um, caste system from the Hindu hierarchy um, categorized particular peoples in Nepal as alcohol drinkers, enslavable, and untouchable. And this included certain groups from regional and national domains of influence and created social inequality. These folks were pushed often to the spatial margins, which then caused them to be more vulnerable to hazards like earthquakes and landslides. I wanna read this quote from a gentleman from our Genote, because I really think it brings to life some of this structural violence that exists in society before this earthquake occurred and how it was brought out after they happened. We, the poor and voiceless people, do not know many hurdles of laws and regulations. Many do not know how to advocate in the court in legal matters. Some cannot express what they have in their heart and mind. Those groups of people are the poor, orphans, children, Dalit, those who are subjected to injustices, those who are excluded by the past regime, and those who suffer socially and cannot live their lives in socially just ways. Only if government representatives have come to see our place, they would have seen the conditions that we were in and helped us more than they did. Our place is a remote place. There's no possibility that any transportation would come here. We have so many problems here and people do not see them. Hazard exposure is eminent in the lives of indigenous peoples on these Himalayan slopes. And I wanna bring that to life for folks. Um, this includes living next to active landslides created by the hazards. Uh, fires that can occur that folks are using squid in agriculture but are not in the same migratory land management regimes they were in before. These are folks crossing an active landslide that was activated by the earthquake that every year is now a hazard. This is in Kashigao. After the earthquakes, people are worried about people going to the forest during the rainy season. Landslides have become more frequent during the rain seasons and pose more threats to us. The landslides are occurring everywhere in the forest. You might have seen them yesterday. In Kashigao, water is flowing downhill onto the village because of the landslides. The landslides have increased more in the summer after the earthquakes. Plants have been swept away by the water. We see lots of cracks in the forest and we have to cross those cracks to walk in and out of the forest. So I'm illustrating for folks here the connection between where people are living geographically, where they are in a social, structurally unequal system and how when a hazard occurs 
they get hit the hardest. And this is evidenced in the earthquake that occurred in Nepal. So inequality is an important theme to follow and its connection to spatial dynamics to understand why this earthquake had the catastrophic impacts that it had. This also forced folks into displacement and feeling that they're in another's place and that they're off their land, I'm often paying rent to a landowner and farming at an elevation different than they're used to. Within this theater, we have a connection between indigenous folks with hundreds and thousands of years of place attachment to where they're living and re-traumatization daily from the land, from the cracks, from the fissures in the earth, from the earthquakes that show daily what happened after this event and evidence of PTSD and negative mental well-being, an intangible impact. All of this we found through the qualitative methods. When I talk about place attachments, I'll share a little bit of uh, the sentiments that folks felt. If we had not been displaced from our village because of the earthquake, then we would not be very happy there no matter what the village looks like. It is the place of our parents and our grandparents. Now with the resettlement in a new place, I may have a new house, but it'll be difficult to continue the kind of social and cultural life and its ethos we used to have in the village. We will be without culture. We will be without religion. We will be without our identity and we'll be without the sense and practice of community that we used to have in the village. People are worried that there's no good prospect for tomorrow in this place. The earthquake has already damaged the place, done. It has been devastated. Should people reconstruct the damaged houses and continue to live here? When people used to come to our village, we used to think, what happened to them? Now we've become like the crazy persons. Pagal, Dukkha. Maybe they have also suffered like this and therefore have come to our place. People were scared of going to the farms due to the earthquake. We abandoned the cornfields in the lower land like that because we were afraid to go there to look after the crops. I had thought this season, I would not be able to harvest any amount of corn. And actually I got nothing from there. Now thinking about ingenuity and resilience in a theater of inequality, and folks are pushed, for example, to these spatial margins, there's also adaptation that occurs and resilience. And it's important to give folks agency and to look at them as active agents in their own recovery as survivors from these events and not labeled as a vulnerable people and needing help from outsiders. This is, um, in this case, we're looking at how culture is integrated with place and relied upon as a safety net in times of need. So in our research in Kashiga, we found that folks returned to their homes by a year and a half at a rate of 92%. And we found that they used mutual aid or PARMA to reconstruct their homes to the new building codes or not, depending on the sit timing of when we talked to them and the payments that were going out for the rebuilding program after the earthquake. We also saw folks using indigenous knowledge to um, rebuild their homes and agro-pastoral livelihoods. And folks were relying on a safety net that existed before the earthquakes that folks used in their daily lives and reinvented it in a time of need. What you're watching here are all folks not trained as carpenters from the local area co-rebuilding each other's homes. And this wasn't uncommon throughout the districts in Nepal. It's been documented in the literature as something very specific and special to this circumstance, even though social capital is something throughout the world that's been relied on uh, for folks in times of need, creating communities of circumstance um, in order to recover. And at times these cross caste and class and socioeconomic boundaries. And this is one of the aspects of resilience that help people recover from the earthquakes or at least mitigate the terrible situation that they're in. So it's important to recognize that in these situations of inequality, we also have uh, resilience that folks rely upon or that emerges and reemerges through cultural traditions that help uh, folks to recover. Uh, you can also see some of the social capital in the majority of the loans that we saw in the areas that we worked in coming from family and friends with low interest. Uh, we also saw the re reimagining of local traditions. Here, you're seeing in a Tihar festival, traditionally a Hindu 
ritual uh, performed here, uh, caroling by Buddhists, sharing a song about how their village was hurt by the earthquake and the landslides, collecting money for uh, landslide and trail repair. I also want to say, I also want to point out that in our study, areas that had more accessibility and some outside aid actually recovered slower than the areas that relied on some of the ingenuity that gave adaptive capacity and thus resilience on what we saw. So here, I want to compare Kashigao to Gatlang. Kashigao is an area that used a lot of uh, mutual aid and Parma and local knowledge to both get back on the land and to return to their homes. Gatlang is at the end of a road. At a year and a half, only 8% were in their homes. They had the most aid than any other place and connections in tourism. So the expectations from the road, as well as from outside NGOs, caused folks to wait to recover rather than relying on some of the existing cultural traditions. Now, I'm not trying to make an argument that we don't need help after these events. Um, after um, disasters, the literature shows that typically help comes quick and then goes away. And here you can see at nine months where their folks were getting help and how it went away after a year and a half. Um, and that's definitely the case in what we saw throughout our sample. Here in Gotland, folks were waiting um, because the road promised concrete, the road promised additional resources, the road promised potentially more NGO programs coming. Um, in Gotland, we saw social class interrelating with rebuilding. Here on the left, you see a household rebuilding with wood of a lower socioeconomic status and one of higher socioeconomic status rebuilding with concrete. However, this village at one time all had homogeneous housing which you can sort of see here at the top, which was the draw on the tourist trail. So thinking of uh, the, the role of aid, uh, some folks in Galang shared with us that many organizations came here, but they first focused primarily on rescue and provide immediate reliefs, but this work was not sustainable. People hope that the government will do something. I don't think they have any hope that organizations will do anything from them now. Now remember, this is coming from places that had the most aid after the earthquake. So conclusions that we came from our study, one, uh, that the earthquakes were definitely a focusing event that showed pre-existing social and economic inequality in Nepal. The poorest and marginal were impacted the most. Access influenced the restoring agro-pastoralism, rebuilding and decisions about rebuilding. Road access and recovery was unpredictable and potentially a trap that forced some folks to wait rather than recover themselves. Hazard exposure was an extreme um, aspect in our highest correlate in our domains of adaptive capacity. Impeded access to pastures, fields, and forests created high landslide vulnerability and perceived risks of danger, perceived risk and danger. A livelihood also was high associations with our domains of adaptive capacity and recovery indicators. Herders, uh, non-irrigated farmers had worse outcomes, business owners and folks with more diversity in their livelihood had better outcomes. Displacement was definitely a critical factor in our results and that's it influenced both the outcomes and your rate of recovery and folks felt like outsiders in the camps. The government relief and reconstruction program um, was slow, insufficient, and limited in scope. There was more, more outside aid definitely did not equal the best outcomes, and more aid did not mean uh, that it was sustainable aid. Housing designs and building codes, traditional architecture helped the recovery rate. The building codes were difficult to innovate with local designs, and folks were having a very hard time adapting indigenous place-based traditions to these externally conceived building designs. And there were more than one, but they definitely didn't take into account, for example, where to put livestock that were uh, babies in the evening uh, to shelter them from uh, pred predation. Uh, mental well-being, cooperation, and work exchange. There was strong place attachment to ancestral settlements. There were new social constructions of dukkha or tension and pagal or feeling like you're crazy or something that folks were calling an earthquake sickness. Parma or work exchange was revised as, revived as a safety net for the poor and marginal. Transformations occurred in everyday life and we saw them in the short term. We saw those pushed by hazard exposure, livelihood disruption, 
displacement and then relocation. And we also saw new skills emerging from the earthquakes and earthquake safe structures being built. I now wanna share some generalized guiding principles as take home messages that we recently published in an article that take the lessons learned from this study and provide them in a generalized way that are adaptable to other disaster contexts. The first is to consider how power and history shape our current realities to produce disasters by identifying root causes, consider relief as different from recovery, consider recovery as occurring over the short and long term with no specific endpoint, and it's also a process, consider recovery as tangible and intangible, Consider both where a household starts in the recovery and where they are headed, and consider recovery as a combination of informed planning and swift decision-making. Remember that culture, history, power, livelihood, and place all matter in short and long-term disaster recovery, and that one size fits all will definitely not work for disaster recovery interventions and response. If you'd like to learn more about our projects, these are our three open access publications to date in World Development, the International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction and Progress in Disaster Science. And we also are starting a second phase of this project to look at long-term uh, natural disaster recovery. And this is gonna look at a recovery between years five through 10, uh, repeating our methodology with the 400 households, as well as identifying uh, looking at the changes in the built environment and also uh, conducting a network analysis. I also want to um, just share that the, the type of lens in which this research um, comes from, which sits at the critical disaster studies as well as the resilience literature, is the type of <clears throat> pedagogy that we're teaching in our new emergency management and community resilience program at Portland State University. And if you're interested in taking an equity lens and looking at hazards and disasters working locally or globally, check out our master's or graduate certificate. And you can think about working in all different stages of this disaster resilience cycle and thinking about as these events continue to increase, uh, such as a tsunami risk, uh, the climate change induced hazards that we're experiencing, as well as where I, we live here, there are imminent earthquakes uh, that are going to occur. Thank you very much for having me today and I look forward to answering your questions. Daniela. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Spoon, for that very informative um, and really a creative presentation. A lot of your graphics were very eye-catching, so I enjoyed um, the time you spent with us today. Um, so we'll now move into our Q&A session, um, which we'll conduct both through the chat function and by the raise hand function you can find under the reaction menu. Um, so if anybody has a question, I'll be more than happy to uh, address you. <laughs> Dr. Stark, are you trying to figure out the, oh, your hand blends in with your book. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Hi, Jeremy. It's nice to see you. Good to see you. Really good. Um, so uh, thanks for this very amazing presentation. Um, it gives me hope, but it also worries me. And I always think about what are best practices. So the, the most concrete question I have is, in this phase two, and I'm so glad you're doing it, are you gonna be able to work with local communities on figuring out what would be better ways for governments to invest money? Cause it looks like they put in money and it didn't work. Yeah, I really appreciate you pointing that out. Um, yes, uh, we're gonna do our best to um, kind of intervene with the different networks that we've created throughout. What's been so exciting is we were invited in by the National Reconstruction Authority to advise on some of their next steps. And we've been working with them and all the different folks from the different disciplines um, trying to get at these really complex problems. So our hope is that through already working with the local newly elected decentralized local governments, which was a really big deal uh, that that even happened after 2017, and now also working with the top downside, the NRA, 
uh, that we will be able to influence. Um, just in 2020, uh, we were doing work, you know, working with these folks, and the head of the NRA um, was pushed, you know, telling us how it took them two years to recognize anything beyond landslide vulnerability uh, in their recovery, just like their policy making decisions. But also, we we have to give them. Um, compassion and understanding for what they were responding to in relation to health and safety and the lack of um, existing infrastructure in Nepal for them to work with. Not to mention the aid world in Nepal, and I know Anna can speak to this, is extremely chaotic and not well tracked. So there was a huge challenge in coordinating the recovery and this idea of everyone getting the same amount of money to rebuild their house, which was ended up being extremely flawed and didn't take into account inflation, didn't take into account any of these power dynamics I'm telling you about. And it's not that people are making miniature houses because that's all the money could pay for. And they were afraid if they didn't build them, they'd, there'd be punitive actions. So it was a very generic kind of solution. It was top down and advised externally too from you know international actors you know so it was a uh, let's just say in a place like Nepal where you've got folks with place based livelihoods that eighty percent have agro pastoral livelihoods there are so many new roads coming in but there are so there's a, a third of the country at one time didn't have road access because of that there's this wealth of local knowledge and people's ad adaptive capacity to work on this land, right? That was kind of overridden by these external processes. And in maybe some places that kind of thinking is okay. I mean, we've seen terrible decision top down in Haiti. We've seen terrible decisions in relation to equity with Hurricane Katrina. Um, right. These spatial dynamics and inequality are the ninth ward in New Orleans. But you can see what happened here in a lot of places, because this happens all the time. That's why I wanna just show this as a charismatic example, but it also is a global phenomenon. Well, I, it makes me think about James Scott and seeing like a state. So on the one hand, I, I agree, big state schemes are fraught with problems, but, but then as someone who thinks we owe a lot to people in similar situations in the US, I also am a little uncomfortable with outsourcing it all to local agencies, right? Because okay. local agencies have their own agendas. And those same people who are on the left quadrant and particularly in the bottom left, they're going to get affected. They're, they're going to have more problems. So I don't know how you get around it, but it's a really interesting example with a lot of implications for other parts of the world, like you're pointing out. Anyway, I don't want to dominate here. I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And also, I just want to say the one last comment that the decentralization that's going on in Nepal right now and that local decision making, Miriam, that you spoke to is mm -hmm. going to be a critical in the next phase of this project, because I think by the time I get back there, every single community will have road access. And those decisions were made by local government as development projects after the earthquake. I just have to add, though, they'll have roads, but then who's maintaining the roads? Like Nobody. And, and they're not <laughs> monsoon friendly. They'll be seasonal and they're not um, surveyed in the it's not it's that's part of the uh, decentralization. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks. Next, Dr. Stir had her hand raised. So you want to go ahead and ask, ask her your question? Sure. Yeah. Following up on Miriam's question, um, I wanted to ask about Ah, my class is starting. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask about China because um, I know across the border that, you know, so for all the rest of you listening, the earthquake didn't stop at the border and China got shaken as well. And so China being, um, you know, not, not subject to the monsoon in that particular area of Tibet and being in a rain shadow and they're having far less of a road problem. They just came in and they built really nice houses. And um, one of our colleagues, Austin, he went there and he came back and he's like, they made Kirong into Telluride. So I guess they made really nice houses, which I have not yet seen. But yeah, what, especially like in the Gatlang area and then, um, the only place where I haven't really been here is Kashigaon. Is that on the proposed um, road through Gorkha? 
well, to no. the power. And like, what was China's relation with um, the particular communities you studied? And then you probably know about other where China was directly involved, which is perhaps further east. But um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about comparisons? Yeah, so um, Kashigao is on, it's, it's off, it's very close in proximity to the Tsum Valley Trek that's now being um, a new tourism kind of thing. And the road is below it that you're thinking of. Okay. Uh, of if it is also near people going to, how else can I situate it for you? You walk there from Arugat Bazaar, which is on the Dading and, um, yeah. Dading and Gorka boundary. And that was traditionally a Noir crossroads for folks coming through with Tibet, yep. Yeah. And it's also a place where Gurum people interact with Noir people uh, and Tibetans, if that, yeah. But, um, okay, well, everything, I mean, the, uh, the implications of definitely uh, the, um, how, how things were stopped through China was, in just in terms of after the earthquake, you know, it was it was just I don't know the implication. It was similar, I would say, to um, how China and India have been playing. We're in the recovery in general after the earthquake as players, as international agencies. Um, China was a little bit more involved in the Arutinote Gorkha situation because of the Buddha Gandaki Dam, and then that India and China are wrestling with each other over funding for that, which now is funded by the Nepal government. So that was a um, definitely point of power. And um, there's also, as you know, there's a strong political tradition in Gorkha in general. So, and in Arutinote, it's extremely um, living. And uh, yeah, the, the aspect of Kashigao, I would say that's unique is its homogeneity. And um, the fact that it has uh, folks practicing Bon, going, you know, very, uh, very old indigenous place-based uh, traditions that, you know, they've migrated there from other areas, but they've been there quite some time. Not the best answer for you. But. Well, also what, what stuck out to me from looking at your data is yeah. that this is a homogeneous gurung place. And this is, all, this is also my research area, but this is a place where I haven't been. And yeah. so what I, what I immediately recognized is, um, of course, they're the ones who are doing Ngor, Tonkor, that's Parma in Gurung, um, where they're, they just got right in and did it because they are this homogeneous Gurung community. Whereas down in Arugat or Arujnote, it's gonna be politics, politics, politics. Yeah. And then on the Tang side, you're gonna have like, a to well, you have a totally different landscape where it's more up and down. And then you have one taking a direct hit and then another one at the end of the road. So you have these totally different situations and expectations, but like for the Gurung area, it's also um, geographically a place where that Padma exchange can take place. Where yeah. in the Tanang areas, because it's so much more pastoralism than like to begin with, the relations are different. And I don't know the Tamang word that would translate as Parma, but Parma is the Nepali word. So it's more like what goes on in kit body exchanges. So farming each other's, um, each other's land. Mm -hmm. And so when you have pastoralism, it's going to be different in well, terms of expectations of how the mutual aid is structured, I guess. Absolutely. Well, I think you see that in the results, right? Where you yeah, have that's what that's what's going on in my head. With, yeah, they like, didn't rebuild each other's houses. They didn't use Parma in the same way, um, and they don't far they don't farm as much as they herd, like you're talking about. And all of that, I think, influenced it. But I think the road and the aid agencies also influenced it because we saw people in Haku coming together more than in Gatla. So you had folks in okay. Galang that also were professional aid receivers uh, and also folks that were hoping that the Tamang Heritage Trail would touch their communities and tourists would come with money. And so you, I think there's an interaction there between the cultural tradition and that political economy. For sure.
Yeah, but I, I think also the Gurung are more privileged ethnic group in the Hindu hierarchy than the Tamang also. And so I think that also influenced the outcomes. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's yeah, I, I love where your mind is going. I love where your mind is going. <laughs> yes. We should write about that. We could. Yeah, yeah. also um, I have pictures of Gatlong if anybody wants to see them in 2007. So you got to check them out and see what the video yeah, I didn't have if one. You all want me to share my screen. I've got four minutes. Okay. <laughs> so Hannah, if you can make it possible, yeah. then I can do it. I can show everybody. Yeah, we're working on it. We all want to <laughs> see them. <laughs> can I just ask while we're waiting, what about the Dali? Where, how do they fit in? Like, don't they just always get the short end of the stick? Absolutely. Yeah. And in, in, in each place we were working, um, they, the best situation for the Dali were in Kashigao where the, they, Parma was used, this work exchange was used and Dali houses were rebuilt also. Mm -hmm. uh, did you guys just see of my screen? Did you see what I- We did see it for a minute, yeah. Anna. Okay. I'll share it back then. Go ahead, Jeremy, sorry. No problem. So, so. Then the, I'd say in other areas, they become more and more marginal and, and, you know, it kind of fits with how their lives Fit, how they migrated to some of those areas in the first place, you know? And uh, so, yeah, uh, we, the longer they had been in communities, the more the community took care of them after the earthquake. And I, that definitely mattered. And that's like when we uh, looked at this Aruchinote area that had a heterogeneous population, you really didn't have that. Uh, you, we saw Noir families using all this wonderful ex ex work. They have a whole different construction of work exchange than Gurung people do, but they used it in another way um, but we didn't, we still, there we didn't see community coming together in some heterogeneous way to take care of each other as much. Uh, they also had hope that the road was going to bring them some uh, aid because they are also at a roadhead. So that affected the interaction as well. That uh, makes me homesick. That looks like someone, is that B Pin? It looks like him. Um, I actually don't know who <laughs> I'm like, oh, he's I know not that from there. So, um, oh. <laughs> He, no, he was random. So I actually, this is my roommate at the time's work that I just got dragged along in. And this other guy is also doing his job. So he's got a printer and he's actually making identity cards because this is, two, this is January 2007 oh. and there's going to be an election. Oh. So you need an ID. First one. So this is what they're doing. He's making ID cards so that people can vote. Um, and this is a very stark picture, but what I really wanted to show you is the house that he's on. So this is what the houses are like in Gatlang um, with this amazing wood carvings and some stone um, foundations, but a lot of wood. And there are built-in rows. Do you have that aerial view? Oh yeah, that's, I think it's Goldung, but anyway, yeah, they're built in rows like that. Oh, gotcha. No, nah, that's not it. Or... Yeah. I don't know if I have an aerial view of Gatlang. This is like as far as I got as I was looking through. No, there's a lot of, there's a lot of inside oh. pictures. <laughs> but yeah, that other one is Golding. It's not Gatlang. Got it. I have there's an aerial view of the road in an earlier photo, I think, where you can see like oh. how hold on. Yeah. Oh that's my. <laughs> but it's gutted now, right? Well, that's the road in 2007 and it's been six years. So I'm sure the road is fine again. I mean, six years since the earthquake. I'm right. sure the road is better than that now. Yeah, and that road existed prior to it. So yeah, yeah that was one of the better roads. Yeah, there's a lot better roads because the now Rasua is the main China um, connection corridor because the one further east that used to be the main corridor was far more destroyed. All right, I'll stop talking. I'll let you all keep on talking. Um, I have class. <laughs> me, um, in case you get out of the Zoom meeting and the 